Hello, and welcome to Simutex Tips and Tricks video series. In this video, we're going to be talking about stress singularities. So let's start with a little bit of background on mesh convergence. In a region of the model that isn't a stress singularity, what you'll see as you refine the mesh is that your stress results will approach some limiting value, which is called a mesh-independent solution. So as you're refining the mesh, your results will change by a lower and lower amount until eventually further refinement of the mesh doesn't change the results anymore. Now, this doesn't happen at a stress singularity, and the reason for that is that the theoretical stress there is infinite. With a stress singularity, since the theoretical stress is infinite, as you keep refining the mesh, you'll continue to get higher and higher stress results. And so let's talk about a couple different types of stress singularities here. Uh, you can get stress singularities from things like crude geometry, so things like sharp edges. Uh, in reality, you know, this edge isn't perfectly sharp, but as you keep refining the mesh here, it looks sharper and sharper, and the theoretical stress there, again, on a perfectly sharp edge, uh, will be infinite, and because of that, as you keep refining the mesh, you'll get higher and higher stress results here. Uh, some other places you can get it are if you apply loads or constraints to a single point. So here, if for example I was to apply a force load to this vertex, I'm applying a non-zero force over zero area, and because of that the theoretical stress there is infinite. It's a similar type of thing on these edges, where you have some non-zero amount of force being transmitted through that edge, but the area over which it's being transmitted goes to zero as the mesh size goes to zero. And because of that, you'll get a stress singularity there as well. Uh, you can also get something like that if you were to apply a point constraint. So for instance, if I applied a displacement constraint to this vertex, in order to maintain that displacement constraint, it'll have to apply some amount of force. And again, we have this non-zero force over a zero area. You can also get stress singularities in a couple other types of places. So, for instance, a fixed support. And so if you have, say, a fixed support on this face here, uh, that's effectively a geometric discontinuity. It's sort of like you have this infinite wall coming out here, and it sort of creates this artificial corner uh, on these sides. Uh, that can also happen with contact regions. So the edge of a contact region can be a geometric discontinuity, which can also create this sort of stress singularity. Uh, the other thing that can happen within contact regions is you may have individual contact detection points that are transmitting some amount of force over a very small or zero area. So you can get stress singularities in both the edges of contact regions and within contact regions sometimes as well. So those are the main sources of stress singularity. So again, things like crude geometry, where you don't have fillets that really would be there. So like this sharp edge, boundary conditions, so like displacement constraints, fixed supports, those can sometimes create stress singularities, point loads, and contact regions as well. So let's look at this particular model, what happens in these two different beams here. So one of them just has a sharp corner, the other one has a fillet modeled, and we'll take a look at the stress. So in this model we've got a fixed support down on these bottom faces. The area we're interested in is the corner here and here. And then we have a force load applied on the end faces of both beams. So if you look at the deformation you can see pretty similar results there. If we look at the stress in both beams, at the moment, the stress is higher in this beam. We've got a very coarse mesh, so this isn't looking as much like a sharp corner since the elements are so big. But what I've done with this model is set up a few parameters. So if we look at the mesh sizing, I've got a body sizing applied on these, and I've set the element size as a parameter. A couple other parameters under mesh. If you go down to the bottom and expand statistics, I've set the number of nodes as a parameter. So this is an output parameter, and I'll be able to see how many nodes are in the model. And then I've also set up a stress result just on this body, and I've made the maximum stress on that body a parameter, and the maximum stress 
on this body, a parameter. And so you can see in this particular part, my maximum stress uh, doesn't even occur in the corner. It's showing up down here. Um, so that'll change location to the corner as we refine the mesh here. So if I go back to Workbench, I can look at my parameter set here. And again, you can see my element sizing. I've solved a variety of different element sizes. And I'm looking at the maximum stress in the fillet beam, maximum stress in the beam without the fillet, and the number of mesh nodes. So I've plotted all this data here. And so you can see, as we refine the mesh with the fillet, uh, we see a little bit of change, actually a small decrease in the stress as we refine the mesh initially. And then eventually it settles into kind of the typical pattern where you have an increase in the amount of stress until you hit some sort of limiting value. And so that's what you see here where changes to the mesh in this region aren't really producing a significant change in the stress prediction. And so somewhere around this point, we'd say we have a mesh independent solution. Oftentimes you'll see one of these plots where the stress is increasing the entire time, but that's not always the case, and it isn't in this particular example. And so something to be careful of is if you make either a small change in the mesh, so for instance, changing to this element size to this one, uh, there's essentially no change in the stress prediction between those two, but it was a small change in the mesh itself, and so you wouldn't necessarily expect a big change. So if you're doing a two-point mesh convergence study, you want to make sure that you're not making a very small change where you'll get the same results anyways. Uh, the other thing you want to avoid is on a very coarse mesh, it's kind of unpredictable which way the stress is going to go. Uh, so down here when the, where the mesh is very coarse, increasing the mesh density could reduce the stress, it could increase the stress. This could be flat right here. So you could make some change from a very coarse mesh to still coarse but not quite as coarse mesh and see no change in the stress results and you don't want to use that to think oh okay then I've got a mesh independent solution. So the important thing to note when you're doing these mesh convergence studies is that you don't want to have two bad meshes that happen to produce the same results. You want to make sure you have a good mesh as your starting point. Now let's talk about the singularity. So this is the stress for the model with the sharp corner. And as you can see, as we keep increasing the number of elements, so we keep refining the mesh, we don't get any leveling limiting value for this. And that's again because the theoretical stress in that sharp corner is infinite. And so we'll never converge to a single value there. So that's something to be aware of, that you can have these type of stress singularities. And if you're doing a mesh convergence study, you'll want to look away from those stress singularities to see if you have a mesh independent solution. If you're interested in the stress in that area, there is another workaround, and I'm going to go ahead and go back to the model to show that. So right here we have a very coarse mesh. So let's go to something a little finer. If I go back to my parameter set here, you can see I have retain checked for a few of these design points. And what that means is it keeps the results file so that I can go back and look at those. So here, let's go over to my one millimeter element size. I'm currently, you can see my DP0 is the current design point. And that has an eight millimeter body sizing. Let's look at a one millimeter. So I'm gonna right click on that and say set as current. And I get a warning saying that some editors are going to close. That's fine. You'll see that mechanical is going to close here. And that's just so that it can go in and update to this other model. All right, so now it's updated to that. If I go back to the project, I'll just reopen the model here. There we go. And here, let's take a look at the mesh. So you can see a much finer mesh here. If I zoom in, you can see again, much smaller element size. Now let's look at the stress in the fillet first. And I'll zoom in a little bit here. And we can see this is a much better distribution of stress here. 
uh, in the coarser model, we had kind of two regions of high stress with a lower stress region in between. That doesn't really make sense for a fillet like this. A distribution like this makes a lot more sense. We can see this is very well resolved with this mesh. And so we have a lot of elements across each kind of contour of the stress. So this is a much better mesh. If we look back at that mesh convergence, I think we're well into the mesh independent region for the fillet here. Now let's look at the no fillet. And so here you can see we've got this very high stress right in the corner uh, that drops off quickly away from the corner. Now, one common way to estimate the stress if you were not to have the singularity is to look at the stress one element away. And that's what this little flag is. So to set up a flag like this, you just go to probe and click about an element away. And it's common practice to use that one element away stress value as an estimate of the stress within a stress singularity. So if you had a point load, say, you could look an element away or some kind of boundary condition or a contact region that's causing you to have this stress singularity. You can check what's the stress an element away, and that's a common value to use as an estimate of the stress that you'd actually see in this region. So I'll go ahead and deactivate the probe. Let's compare this to the stress in the fillet. So this is about 41 KSI or so. Now if we go over, let's look at the fillet stress. We can see the maximum is uh, about 43 KSI. So that's reasonably close. It's certainly better than if we're looking at just the maximum here than this 63 KSI estimate. So that's a good place if it's impractical to get rid of the stress singularity. You know, a lot of times if you have, say, a contact, that may be an effective geometric discontinuity that you can't really get rid of. So looking one element away may be the best you can do there. Or if it's impractical to use boundary conditions that wouldn't result in some sort of stress singularity, this can be a helpful way to do it. Another time this can help is if you have some sharp edge and in real life it would have a very small fillet but it's not practical to actually model a fillet that small in the model. Again, you can look one element away and use that as an estimate. That concludes this video. Thank you for tuning in.